Is this thing on? Yesterday's price is not today's price. All right, welcome back to a brand new edition of the Run the Numbers podcast. I'm CJ Gustafson, here with my host, co-host today, Curtis Haney. Welcome, man. Hey, good to be here. Excited to chat. I love the questions that we got. So, Did you ever think you'd be on the number three business management podcast in Luxembourg? <laughs> Is is there how many are there? Are there three or are there there, there are three and we're okay. in the top three. Okay. So you've made awesome. it to the big time, my friend. Yeah. Well, we, we may need to take a trip over there and 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 see your fans in person. So shake all their hands individually. So shout out Luxembourg. I always like to say, like, you've you've been a CFO at companies that like make real things. I've been a CFO at uh at companies that, you know, sit behind uh, you know, the bits. There's there's good and bad to each side, but I'm going to tell you in, in the business, the first business I was CFO, like having over a thousand employees, that's not fun. Like that's a lot, you know, it was professional services, meaning our people were servicing the client. And so you get a lot of employees for very little revenue and, uh, and that's not, that's not fun. It's all puts and takes. Right. And I think like the longer that I'm in this game, I'm finding out you can make money at anything if you're really good. Like I'm, I'm sure the number one pickleball player in the world makes a shit ton of money and you would never think like, oh, you can make money playing pickleball. But like people always say this industry is better than that one. But I think at the end of the day, the majority of the returns in anything just go to the whoever's the best at it, if, whether it be software, real estate, anything. Well, and that's what uh, Clint Murphy, I don't know if you know him from Twitter, but he talks about he talks about pairing unique or different skills together. And I think when you pair you know, finance and writing, not very many good people are good at both of those. So I think that's why, you know, I've had success at that as I've written my whole life. That's why you've had success because you're a really good writer. There's a number of other examples of people in that space. We just got lucky that we're one of 10 in the world, probably that, that, uh, that actually can do both. Right. Cause, cause it's not, it's not, not common for that to be the case. Yeah, we're <laughs> balance sheets by day, uh, you know, notebooks by night. And I, when, whenever people ask me for career advice, I always say to try to create like your own skew that's a category of one. And to piggyback on what you were saying about stacking your skills, I think it was Scott Adams who wrote um, the Dilbert comic. And he was saying like he was successful, not because he was the best like writer, maybe he was like, 75th percentile not because he was the best artist maybe he was like 50th percentile um and not because he was the funniest maybe he was like 80th percentile well when he combined all three of those he created his own category and he was pretty damn good at it yeah yeah 100 percent. and i think like you look at this and i think with businesses and and more people going the independent route you know, less being you just go and get a job and you work for these big companies and ha people having more autonomy in their career. I think that's going to become even more and more true as you get over the next 10 to 20 to 30 years. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see, but I, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, man. What's the first question we want to tackle here? Gav, my buddy, Wolf Financial, he asked, and and I don't know the story behind the podcast. I don't know if you have you talked about the story behind the podcast on here. No, I. What got you interested in running it and uh, inspired to start it? That's a good one. And uh, I think it was like the internet creates this weird surface area for good things to happen. Where like minded people like me and you, like we come from different backgrounds, different places in the U.S. You're in Oklahoma, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in Florida, originally from Massachusetts, like the internet, like somehow you find fellow nerds that enjoy the stuff you enjoy. And uh, I ended up meeting Eric Tornberg, who was launching the Turpentine Network, kind of like the Barstool Sports or the um, the ringer of like podcasts for business. And he had approached me, hey, have you ever thought about a podcast? And I was like, I've never even like done a podcast. I don't really know how that works. And he was like, hey, I, I like your writing. I think that we could try to help you create like the category of one, but for podcasts and for finance people. And so it's kind of been my outlet to just talk in like a more casual setting about the stuff that I'm already writing about. And it actually helps me reflect on what I'm learning like real time with uh, 
being a CFO and being a first time CFO. And the biggest draw to me wasn't like, oh, you can make some extra money doing this. I always joke like, oh, I got to pay all these daycare bills because like they're totally stacking up and the Amazon bill. That's the only thing me and my wife fight about in our relationship. <laughs> say. It's the Amazon bill. Do, who, who has the problem? Is it you or her? Oh, it's her. It's it's like every single day. It's to the point that Georgia, our daughter, comes home from school and thinks that they're like gifts every day that she gets to open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. like a thing like every day, like, oh, she's going to go open the packages now. Like we have a problem if it's every single day you can, you, you're going to open the packages. Yeah. It's like Christmas doesn't mean anything anymore because every day is Christmas. <laughs> is that what it is? Thanks a lot, Bezos. But uh, <laughs> where, how did I get on that? But, um, but I, I kind of like what drew me to this was if it didn't work out, at least like maybe I get 10 episodes in and I get shit canned, but I got to talk to 10 CFOs who are smarter than me who could give me advice. And like, to me, that's a life hack. And it's one of the reasons why I started writing. And I'm not sure if you feel this way, but I was like, it's pretty hard to ask a successful person, can I grab five minutes of your time or buy you coffee? But if you say, hey, I have a platform and I think you're an expert at something, can you help me write something about this? Or can I interview you on this? Then they, then they actually pick up the phone. Yeah, no, 100%. And that was where I was stupid when it came to podcasts. As I said, I don't want to do another interview podcast. So when I was running my podcast, it was all me. And then I'm like, wait a second, these people that are getting these really good intros to these crazy good people, they're in, it's because they're interviewing them. And so in a lot of ways, interviews is scratching your own itch. And you were already doing this with your newsletter while you were already interviewing people, you know, in, in writing those interviews up. And in a lot of ways, I was thinking I need, I should be doing that. One, the writing is great because it gives you the ability to process. That's been the huge, the biggest thing for me is I've had, I've had things that have come out of just writing of ways I do my job better. But then when you can incorporate other people into that, it's like going from triple A's to major leagues, right? It's like, I'm on triple, I'm triple A's on myself, right? Because I've gone from single A or double A now to triple because I'm writing it down. And then when you start bringing other people's insights, now you're playing in the majors because now you're distilling their information too. So, dude, yesterday in a meeting, I, I like, I said this phrase, I forget what it was. And I realized it was like verbatim what the CFO of Carta had told me. <laughs> and I was like, it, it was like he was in my head. And I was like, that was so cool. Like I actually like applied something without even thinking about it twice. Yes. Yes. And did you, did you give him credit or did you just take that credit? No, I acted like I came up with it. You totally acted like, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm the smartest exactly. person out there. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, it's actually funny you say that because I, I've been in a couple of meetings since I've been writing and I would say things in those meetings that I'd either written or seen other people and like people would look at me and there would be like, They'd like, give me this look like, this isn't you, like, this is not your stuff. And at one point someone even made a comment. He's like, man, since you've been writing, you've like, you've really learned to like put yeah. your thought down concisely in this, <laughs> like basically, you know, giving me props on that. And I was it's like, it's so oh, true. You find yeah. yourself like speaking in like these short paragraphs that you wrote like two weeks ago. And they're like, <laughs> where did you come up with that packet of words <laughs> to describe like an arcane yeah. topic, like stock-based comp? Like, did you just pull that out of your ass? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. And that's what a lot of people don't realize is like a lot of, and I'm assuming the same with you, a lot of what you're writing is what you're dealing with. And so you're processing through it in the writing and then going and applying it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like having like a, like a work therapist to work through like whatever, whatever shit you're going through at that point to, to write it down. And that, I mean, it's, it is scratching your own itch in a lot of ways. It's a, it's somewhat of a selfish pursuit, but I found that by being selfish and writing about stuff I'm interested in, like that, that's how I found audience market fit before I was writing and, you know, trying to create content for like this fictional smart person. I thought that was out there and I'm like, dude, just like write for yourself. And then it, people will like that. I don't know. I, I forget where it comes from, but they talk about, right for right for who you were six months ago or a year ago, right? Because that's what you know the best. It just happened. You haven't forgotten all the learnings. Um, and you're just pro and you're processing what you're kind of currently going through. So that, that's what someone said to me, like your ICP, your ideal customer profile is you five years ago. I was like, Oh, shit, that's right. That's that's deep. Let me throw one out there. And then we can go down the list. And it was the one that stuck out to me the most. It was from Ivan Makarov, VP of finance at Webflow, who I interviewed on the podcast, incredibly intelligent and thoughtful guy. And he, he came, 
he came from the top ropes. This is a hard one. He said, what is the biggest lie we tell ourselves as finance leaders? I think it's that uh, we believe we can solve things with just numbers from behind a spreadsheet a lot of times. And that, you know, if we make this plan that we put a lot of effort into, that's like the majority of the battle. But that's only like a very, very small portion I'm finding the longer I'm in this. It's you have to actually go out and talk to people and catalyze change like by by physically being there by talking through problems. And I've caught myself too many times making these very detailed plans where I'm where I'm almost trying to get lost in the work that goes on behind the scenes. Like I'm going deeper and deeper into this when I really should have just went out and talked to somebody. That's very similar to what, what I said and or what I was thinking about. Because when you think about the numbers portion if you want to go anywhere other than just be a spreadsheet warrior, you know, staff account, you know, you know, FP&A analyst, like if you want to go anywhere above that or different than that, spreadsheets and, and that sort of work becomes like 10 to 20% of the whole game. Right. And I, what I, the way I frame this is I say, because we're good at spreadsheets and like putting that together, we convince ourselves that we know what we're actually talking about. Yeah. Yeah. You do. You, it's almost like a lie. You, it is a lie. You tell yourself that like, I, I know what I'm talking about. I know the numbers here. It's like, well, the numbers even remotely reflect reality. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and it was like, I don't like until you can translate your numbers to an outside party, to someone else in a different discipline in a way that they actually understand those numbers you don't truly understand the numbers that you're putting together. Yeah. That's, that's the reality. And honestly, that was me for, so I had done presentations for the, the owners of, again, this multi-billion dollar private company. I had gone through these financial models and like talked to them about all this stuff. And then I come to the small business and we sit down with the financial statements for the first time. And I'm sitting there thinking, like he asked me a question. It was a simple question about gross margin. And I like froze because I wasn't sure like how to answer that question. Because I like theoretically knew what all this meant, but I didn't know what it meant in relation to the business and the business outcomes that that we were trying to achieve. He's like, son, you're you're just talking math to me. What am I do I have money in my business? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and that was when I said, Yeah, let me look and I'll get back to you. So Thankfully he is forgiving in that. But so it took me a number of years in that. And I realized like it, it's not until you do it and you immerse yourself in those other parts of business, those other things that you can actually start to truly communicate and like be an advocate for like those particular numbers. It's kind of in the same realm. I thought of a couple of different ones in here. One of these I feel pretty strongly about, and I'll tell you, I'm the worst at it. Okay. So complexity makes a good financial model. That's such a lie. Like if you cannot explain the model and how it works and what's driving the changes to the dumbest person on the team, and you cannot give it to another person and have them be able to manipulate it in the way that they want to, to get to like, you know, to update the numbers, then you've just got a little play toy. You don't actually have a financial model. And so I've gone the other direction of like, I build the financial model in a way that I use the least number of variables and then I can tell directly what's driving the numbers. A lot of the small details can be such like a ton of noise. And the reality is, is there's typically just going to be a handful of things that are the key drivers in, you know, whatever you're trying to get to. Hey, thanks for listening. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and one. 36,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, 
and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash metrics. That's netsuite.com slash metrics to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash metrics. I've, I've made that mistake of like, just, just trying to build like a particle accelerator. Like, it's like, dude, I, I just need to predict the uh, cash burn here. And, and just putting in so many inputs that you lose track of like, from a first principles perspective of like, what actually matters here? There are probably only two things in the model that are like, you know, 80, 20, what, what do you have to get right? And instead, like I tried to build like the Taj Mahal of models and it, it was, it was useless. It was pretty, but it was useless. I was looking at an ownership model, uh, a model that was modeling out different ownership scenarios. And this guy built it really complex because he was trying to take in all these different elements. And I worked on this. We, we worked on it off and on for probably two years. And then we eventually just had to scrap it. And like, I'm re I've, I'm in the process of rebuilding it from scratch because we could not get all of those dependencies to work and know and be confident that what we were actually looking at was right. I'm just realizing that like some people work on like old cars and rebuild them in their garages. And like me and you just work on old Excel models and rebuild them <laughs> in our spare time. <laughs> That's fair. That's hundred percent fair. You don't, you don't get these smooth hands, right? You don't get these smooth <laughs> yeah. hands from, from sitting around doing nothing. That's so funny because I drive a pickup truck, like a big pickup truck. And my wife always jokes to her daughter, like, Oh yeah, dad, daddy drives a big pickup truck. Cause he doesn't work with his hands all day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, there's probably something to that. You gotta, you gotta be manly in some way, right? Yeah. Right. My V lookups are, are super manly. <laughs> You're still using V lookups, X lookups, man. Right? Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> what do we got next? <laughs> you can tell how outdated it is by which, uh, which formula is using, right? Well, let's stick, let's stick on this. Cause you know, I've been asked that question about the biggest lie we tell ourselves, Andrew, good man asked a, asked another good question of what's the best career advice you've ever received and what is the worst? Andrew Lynch, good man from Twitter, one of our FinTwit friends from across the pond. I think the best advice I've been given, part of it is kind of frustrating because you don't want that to be the case. And it's kind of sad, but it's the, the, the higher up you get, the more people around you are going to want you to fail. And it happens a lot at like cutthroat tech firms where if you're getting promoted a lot and you're going up, people will say they're rooting for you, but it's human nature to have some envy. And as a result, don't take any shortcuts or do anything sketchy is basically the headline. Because if you do, you will eventually get burned on it. And the higher up you go, you will have chances to cut corners. But if you cut a corner once, and you get caught, people, especially as a CFO, people are always going to know you as the person who did that. And that is like the hardest thing to come back from. It's probably impossible as a CFO. And I, I've taken that like really seriously. Like when I've seen opportunities, like you could make a quick buck doing something. Like I, I always remember that. Have you seen any examples of that up close or is it just like just kind of distant stuff? Yeah, I've seen it before with like equity grants for certain people. I've seen it before with like people getting raises outside of comp like review cycles. I've seen it before with like deals done on a handshake with partners that, you know, are helping people in other ways. I'm sure you you've seen opportunities pop up where you're like, I could take advantage of that. That would be pretty cool right now. That, that seems like an easy way to get ahead, but I think you either have it or you don't as a CFO to the ability to say no to temptations and, and not get burned on them. Yeah, honestly, I'm trying to think like I've heard some horror stories like in small businesses about, you know, people, uh, people taking advantage of business owners and that sort of deal. You know, the big difference between kind of SMB and startups is startups tend to be that like cutthroat 
you know, sort of deal. Whereas SMB, you're dealing with a, a laziness or like very much on the CEOs or leaders personality versus like that. I want to be the type of person that the more someone gets to know you, the more they respect you. Whereas the other way around of someone getting to know you and like respect you less and less, because in the only way you can do that is by having like your actions and your word and everything line up. And that goes, you know, to being above reproach, like in that CFO seat. So when I, with all of my teams, that's the stuff that I talk about is like, we're doing this so that if anyone were ever to say anything to the CEO about something, they did this, that was bad their first response would be, well, that could never be true because you've, you've done everything to, you've gone overboard and like over communicating your intent over and in communicating the processes, the way you're doing things, because you want to be clear that, that, that is your goal from the very front. Um, because in SMB in particular, the CFO and CEO relationship is very heavily built on trust, right? because the CEO is typically the, you know, the owner. And so it's that CFO owner relationship. And so there has to be more than just a working relationship. There has to be an integrity and a, you know, and a trust there that, that is not, that is a more than what's normal there. And I think this goes across both, you know, sectors or types of businesses, but part of that advice I remember was like, don't, don't ever you yourself do something that would make you not sleep at night because in the position you're in, there are going to be a million other things that are going to make it so you can't sleep at night. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've, I, I, I've been there with cash flow issues and yeah, it's, it's uh, not fun, but. What's the worst career advice someone's given you? I couldn't think of any good examples for worst career advice. So my best and my worst are kind of two, two in one go and work with people, not work for companies. Because the worst career advice and the one I didn't take was just go work in public accounting and stick to this like one very central path. That's what we tell accounting students a lot of time. It's like there's these two levels, right? There's the people that are going the CPA route. Um, and then there's people that are going the other route. And it's almost seen as this other route is like a less than route. Right. And, and so to me, that's the worst mentality for accounting because it, what, what it ends up doing is it gets people in the accounting profession that are just obsessed with the accounting profession versus obsessed with the business side. A, a lot of these accounting jobs that you see are going to be gone are going to be significantly different with AI and with all of this. And so I think that's especially bad advice now because you're going to get a very narrow skill set. And then that very narrow skill set is going to make it to where you're either having to switch later on or you're having to learn new stuff on the fly. Whereas following that first advice of following people over companies or over a specific job path, you're going to get a lot more broad experience, which is going to make your ability to integrate that accounting to all of these technological changes that are coming even more valuable. It's going to make your accounting education way more valuable in the long term. The nugget of truth I pick out of there is you don't let people put you in a box either. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. Do we want to move to the next one? Let's do it. Moon, Moonaby Gallant. You're going to embarrass me if I start pronouncing names in here. So uh, what's the, first financial metric to track when you run a startup cash cash yeah so cash just what cash in the bank that's it cash runway it would be cash runway for me uh it's kind of like maslow's hierarchy of needs food then shelter then you know you end up at wi-fi at the very top but um, I think you need cash on day one just to be able to operate. Cash is like oxygen. Like it gives you time to figure things out. And then after that, I would move on to figuring out like productivity wise, what's my revenue per head. I always like that one. I call it the goat of SaaS metrics. I think it works for any type of business. What would you say? Revenue for head is a good one. But yeah, what I put is runway, then understanding how much you're burning per month 
Um, and then the, the kind of third question is like, how are you going to start generating your revenue? Like what actions are you going to take to start generating? Yeah. So once we understand what our burn is, how are we going to start generating? I think people, when they, when they go raise money or they go do these sort of things where they're starting a business that requires some sort of capital, um, that's not just them, you know, on their own doing something that a lot of people don't look at the downside of what, what that could be. And they focus on the big vision versus the, you mean like the keep the lights on case? <laughs> yes. Versus the keep the lights on. And so, you know, what's the worst case scenario and, and how can we, how can we try and avoid that? Um, because if you look at companies that get to scale, very rarely are they exactly what they came in with from day one. Right. Yeah. So that's a good one. You're also talking to a guy who, who, who lives and dies by uh by cash burn. Like I don't work in places where we actually make money, Curtis. <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, I've been in, well, let's say one of the businesses we started up didn't make money and that was, yeah. I, I wouldn't know what to do with the dollar of EBITDA if he gave it to me, if, I, if it hit me in the head. <laughs> I, I'm more on the, uh, I'm more on the cash flow side, right? Let's optimize. Like I said, this. you're building real things for the real economy. That's right. Yeah. You. <laughs> yeah. So that's, and that's why with these, with all of these SaaS people, right, is, is, um, their job is, their job is easy, right? Cause they can just go ask other people for money. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty easy. You know, we just walk around asking for money and put in the bank for a rainy day. That's right. That's right. Yeah. What do we got next? All right. So Karen sued says, how do CFOs keep a line of sight on their pricing strategy so they don't run into issues like what happened to Unity Software last week, which led to their CEO's resignation? Basically, they changed the way I think that uh, gamers got paid with within the software and it caused a whole uproar. But whenever someone new joins our company, the first thing I do is I explain to them how we make money. I walk them through how we monetize our product because I firmly believe that influences every single thing that you do in the company. And I've been at places and been in the seat where it's been like this hand wavy thing. Like I kind of understand this whole subscription thing and maybe there's a maintenance contract attached to it, but it was like, I didn't really get it. Like I couldn't totally walk somebody through like how a dollar enters the building and, and why it's important to fund everything that's going on. So, I mean, when it comes to pricing, I think you have to figure out like how your users realize value from whatever your product is. So like the two examples that I, I always go to is like classic subscription, like a Salesforce license. It's probably going to be tied to a seat. Whereas, you know, a usage based model, maybe it's like, based on number of emails sent, like that's very intimately tied to however the user is getting value out of it. And if you upset the apple cart of, of how you charge people, it can really mess up how you get revenue and then your whole P&L. <laughs> yeah. And I, I've, I've not been in a situation where we've changed our pricing model midstream. I don't know. Have you ever been in that situation? Yeah, I've been in situations where we went from like having a perpetual license model where basically uh, you buy it once and you get it forever. But if you want updates to it, you have to pay for this huge maintenance contract, which is actually more expensive. And then we said, we got to go to like a full time subscription model. I've also been at companies that went to a usage based model as well. And like, it's actually really scary because if you get some of those small adjustments wrong and the market doesn't accept it like you think it will. Like you can totally blow up what you're doing. You know, developers are generally pretty independent. You know, they're a, a non associate like they're not working together, but they do, they kind of have this, these scenarios where they come together. Like, like I've not, I can't think of any example, but where they don't like something that happens and they all come together to kind of like, yeah, you see it on Reddit forced, all the time. Force their will, right? Yeah, yeah, that was one of Reddit's shut down, right? Because of some changes that they were made for a period of time a while back. Yeah, I think like the the kernel of wisdom in here is that when you have a community based product, it's super dangerous. So, like if it's if it's not predicated on like B two B, it's not like corporations making decisions with other corporations saying yes or no, but like people who are passionate and live by this product or make money off of it. Like that's where it gets really dicey about, you know, upsetting people. 
Yeah. Well, and, and that's a situation where even a small group, but a, a small vocal group can have an outsized impact. Right. Whereas with B2B, to have that same impact, you'd have to have 50% basically leave because they were unhappy with the choices that you had. So yeah, for me, I don't have experience with that, but I think generally my thinking was it's just generally a communication issue, right? Is you've not talked to the people that are going to be impacted by it enough. Yeah. Something that I learned from the CFO of Brex is Michael Tannenbaum, who I interviewed, is when you make a change to like pricing or how you treat a certain segment of customers, you should really A, B test it with like a small segment of customers. We're actually going through this now at the company I work at, where like we're rolling out a different pricing and packaging strategy around certain SaaS modules. And so like we're rolling it out with like, all right, let's 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 tell 100 customers about it and roll it out. Then let's tell 200 and then see how many of those tell you they're going to churn. Because what you don't want is to hit like all, say it's, 15,000 customers in one whack with the message. And it's like, damn, I totally you know, swung the bat and, and missed the ball there. Like that's, that could be, that could be catastrophic. And this is like where the product minds come into play. Like let's AB test this messaging actually before we roll it out. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, and that's, that's clear that he didn't do that or they didn't do that as a team. And he's the one that is being impacted by that. Right. And he had almost 10 years, I think, with that business and yeah so, and they went public they were they were doing really well yeah so 10 years down the drain because you didn't because you didn't ask about your um <laughs> you didn't ask about your pricing strategy you thought you knew your users better than you did and um you saw brex made a shift with the way that they the customer that they did and um they talked that i actually do remember that in that interview he talked about a b testing that um, and they completely, they also provided an off ramp. Yeah. Yeah. Provide an off ramp. If you did want to churn to try to be good stewards of their customers on the way out. So if that's a possibility, provide, provide the off ramp. So, all right. Um, Andy Muborn, who says, what is your current take on the economic landscape and how it might impact startups and small businesses? And then Chris, um, Bocher, I believe he said, I'd be curious to hear your perspective on um, how you feel about the money printer getting turned off his exact words. <laughs> so money printer. Go <laughs> so ah, very similar. You go first. I feel like you're, you, you, you watch the news more than I do. I, well, I don't, I don't honestly, but I've been trying to keep track because I feel like, I get a lot of these questions from different small business owners. Um, yeah, I'd and imagine. I imagine this is, and I, 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 let me go and I'll talk about my situation and then, then I'll see how you think yours is different because as I was thinking about this, what I think from, from a startup perspective, the economic landscape does have a pretty decent impact because a lot of startups are B2C. So it's going to be more directly impacted by those trends. But then you're also raising money and valuations and your ability to get more money into the business are going to be impacted. But from a small business perspective, which is my, you know, the majority of my people that I deal with, like, I think the focus on economic landscape and conditions is way, way overvalued because there may be there may be a trend that you can get caught up in but every time there's a downturn there's going to be a couple of different breakouts people that are breaking out and those breakouts are always growing they're never they're almost i, I say always i can't say always right there, someone has probably there's probably been a sector where everyone went down and someone went down less than others but that's very rare. And most of the time, the big, the businesses that are winning are still growing. So to me, your focus should be on making your business, business resilient and figuring out how to continue growing your business. And I think that's really, I think that's true across the board, but I think that's especially true in, in SMB space. Um, I do feel like startups are a little bit more 
at the whims of of the general market. But I want I was wondering what you thought about that. I think that the core to anything is just to build a really good product, and that's how you build that resiliency. As you were saying, like it, it's kind of banana land out there with interest rates and all the stuff that's going on, and people. You know, they think that there's this Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. I mean, guess, I mean, I guess there kind of is with the Fed, just like eh, pull the lever today, 0.25. Huh? Um, but at the same time, like you can't, you can't really control that. And I think a lot of people get caught up in this like hurry up and wait type thing. Like we're, we're gonna we're gonna go when we're ready, and like the economy is good. It's like no, but the opportunity may pass you. Like a whole new technology may come out. Like you saw with AI, like just things just getting completely wiped. So if you if you don't just go for it, build a great product that people like, and then have some modicum of responsibility around cash management, then like, I don't know, what, what are you playing the game for? Like, you can't let everything from the outside, you know, Im- impact your decision making of when you start to build. Yeah, this, the decision, the right decision, it's never the right decision to, to not make a decision. Yeah, <laughs> you can choose to wait but it's because you're looking for specific conditions. And I think when people, most people say, we're gonna wait for the economy, they're not choosing specific conditions and when they're gonna act, right? And so no matter what the situation is, you have got to have a plan. And I think people saying what you said there of, oh, we're just gonna wait till the economy gets better. That's a non-choice, like they're not making a choice. Yeah, that's because a non-choice. They've they've never defined what economy is, like what what turning around or what good is, um, you know. So yeah, hundred percent. I think we're on the same page on that. Ha- have you ever had to deal with like where you guys are, where you're in a situation where you're you're trying to raise money, but you're worried about availability down the road? Like how is how is the economy like impacted um, any fundraising decisions? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at my last job, I helped raise over eight hundred million dollars in a two-year time period. You know, no secret, we burned a ton of cash, and uh, it was like crazy multiples and people throwing on hundred x revenue multiples. Like, when has a business <laughs> ever been actually worth a hundred x yeah. their revenue? That is just like nonsensical. But at the time, we all talked ourselves into it, and it was awesome. And then I started to see some cracks, and um, when I moved over to my next job, I think like I got scared straight a little bit with what what it wasn't directly happening to me but I was seeing it with other companies around me and I said I don't want to ever grow at a rate that just feels like the wheels are falling off and you're doing it like chopping off your nose to spite your face type thing and um I've definitely been in those situations but luckily like I've worked with some incredible founders who are very very aware of like their position in the market. Like they don't tell themselves lies. And I think that's where companies get into those situations where they take a deal. I don't want to say like VCs are the devil, but you're making a deal with the devil of when you take money that, you know, you can have the valuation. I'll give you the high valuation, but then you get zero wiggle room on the forecast that you're telling me. And I'm talking about that five year chart that everybody kind of makes up. Like how the hell are you going to tell me five years out, you're going to be at $200 million in revenue. Like I may as well just like throw, throw a dart at the wall. Um, or you can take a more modest valuation and then you have more wiggle room. And what everybody did, myself included, is we said, tell him what he's won, Johnny, you know, $10 billion valuation or whatever. And then you have no wiggle room. So you can definitely back yourself into a corner. And I think that's what a lot of companies are seeing in the economy right now that like they took this premium valuation that's going to take five years to grow into, but now they need more cash because they're running the company as if the gravy train was never going to end. People ask the question, like, when are valuations going to return, right? And I've seen that asked a million times on Twitter now. Drives me nuts. And and when you look at the charts, valuations are just now to, like, the 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 historical trend. Right? Yeah. Like, they're not... That was the outlier, not the norm. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, are, are we going to return? Are we going to return is just telling me something is fundamentally wrong with yeah with the way we're approaching yeah, hurricanes aren't the norm you know i think i think there might be a case for valuations being a little bit higher than they were like historically but i don't know you know how far back you go to uh, the ability to touch the whole world these days and age is is definitely a game changer but 
in in reality, they they shouldn't have been what they were at, and, yeah. and people's obsession with getting them back there is is a little bit exhausting. So, <laughs> what do we get next? All right, we have uh, Nicholas, our buddy. Reach out to one of us; we'll hook you up with Nicholas. Shout He's out, mega cool hit tool. Yeah, mega hit. Shout out. It says, how is startup finance different from SMB finance? Hmm. Well. And this is going to sound so cliche, but they're similar in the sense that it all comes down to people where they're different is how you resource the business and the desired outcome that you want to get. Like startups are going for this power law outcome of like trying to return like their investors funds, um, but with a high probability of striking out SMBs a lot of times. Um, well, a, you know, have a different cash profile after creating something real, like we joked about. Um, and you know, they have different incentives and outcomes for the owners of the business. Like there's nothing wrong with like a business that just prints money every year. In reality, that's, that's very beautiful. <laughs> and I think that's what a lot of startups actually want to get to. It's just, they're delaying that to try to do it at a bigger scale down the road, which may or may not happen. It comes down to the people. It comes down to the stakeholder, right? In small business, you're typically fewer stakeholders, and the, the stakeholder and the expectation from the stakeholder is what drives every other piece of it. So where the money comes from, also the speed, right? Because because inherent in the startup world is you're trying to get the quickest return. Risk is really not like, it is a thing, but it's like, it's not viewed at the same as it is SMB because SMB in the majority of cases, if that business goes up, that guy's filing bankruptcy. Right. And so, so the, their ability to, or their desire to take on risk is going to be the risk profile significantly different. Have you ever had to talk a client or one of, uh, you know, the owners that you worked with into taking more risk? Like you thought they were leaving money on the table? Um, so that is a very good question. I have not had to, I think that is more common than not though. Um, I've been in situations where people were very not super risk averse. And so I've, I've never been in a situation where I had to talk them out of or talk them into a risk. It's been the opposite. I've had to um, say, hey, we need to hold more cash back, right? Because they had a hard time prioritizing the different priorities and choosing one. And it's like, you know, actually, in this case, we need to choose one. We can't be making three bets that are all expensive and not put ourselves on the brink of one slow payment cycle from a client and we're struggling, you know? So I've, I've been in the opposite, but, um, from what I've heard and talked to most business owners really struggle with that anxiety of things spinning out of control. And so, um, I've not been in a situation because I've not been doing it long enough with clients where I've had to encourage the risk. But I think I think I see that day coming more often than the other way around. And I think in startups, like it's a, just a different risk tolerance and profile. And especially with startup founders, you you discover that, you know, and this is what um this is what I learned from Mark Hawkins, who is the uh, old CFO of Salesforce. He said, as a CFO, you need to find your place on like the risk frontier and find your own voice because the board is going to always want you to be a little more conservative, like in terms of like cash burn and stuff, even though they do want you to like make a crazy outcome, which is another topic, you know, do both. Uh, and then you have entrepreneurs and founders who somehow made it through the maze to, you know, become a big com company that's growing fast. And they did it by taking crazy risks that actually paid off. So it's, sometimes you're like, who am I to tell this person who has actually backed it up along this way to get the company to this point and taking these crazy risks and slept on couches and eating ramen noodles to say like, stop taking risks or, or moderate them. So it's always like this brokering of, of risk at a company that they have. Don't become numb to the risk, meaning don't discount the risk because it's worked. You need to always, in my view, people think like bringing and talking about risk like means that you're ne you're naturally against something, but I think it's it's kind of so. Um, Adam Grant wrote the book Think Again, and what he talks about is as you become more knowledgeable in something, you hold that thing less, like you hold that opinion 
less firmly, you're more willing to accept or have open discussion or say, yeah, this could be someone else's opinion of this could be a possible outcome. What do they say? Strong opinions held loosely. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And, um, and I think the same goes for risk is when we ignore the risk, we're being that know-it-all that is, you know, confident, but not as far along. But I think when you can acknowledge the risk, it gives you the ability, when you acknowledge the risk, it gives you the ability to say, how are ways that we can combat it and yeah. then go forward with the decision? Dude, I love that. It's not saying no to a risk. It's being aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. You don't want to discourage people from making moves. Um, and and I, I actually, I think I tweeted this the other day. So finance and accounting, this could have gone in like, what are the biggest mistakes of finance and accounting tend to be the no people. And it need we need to not be the no people. We need to be the people that they want to bring in the room because they know we're going to add to that conversation. And we we get to that point by being excited about their about their ideas with them, right? That's and cool. Looking looking for ways to say yes to their ideas versus looking for ways to say no. That's awesome. Like they they think that you're going to help that you're going to be additive to helping their department grow. You're not going to say no and that you're going to get excited and celebrate their wins with them. I like that. I can't say I've always done that. Right. No, but I've definitely not always. Yeah, done that. definitely. Definitely not. But that's what I'm saying. That's what my goal is. Um, that's what I've been thinking about. So want to do uh, one or two more here um, from our buddy only CFO um, on Twitter. He asked how to close the books faster. Oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, we, <laughs> I don't, I don't know that I can go deep on this. What a jerk. <laughs> I know. Right. Uh, optimizing your data flows, create good processes and checklist, and then change the company culture. Cause I think culture is a lot of times the biggest thing holding you back from a fast close is people aren't culturally used to that. If you're in a business that is closing slowly. Um, so obviously we could go a million different directions with that one, but, uh, that was, that was my, uh, that was my pithy response. I like it. And I, I think it's about getting comfortable with your tech stack and not changing it. Like every other month I've seen people try to over optimize their tech stack, but they're always ripping something out. And it's like, no, we're going to be five days later this month or this quarter, because, you know, we just implemented this or that. Um, it's like, just get NetSuite, shout out NetSuite sponsor, uh, and, and, you know, get comfortable with the other stuff, whether it's like a, a, a Brex or something for your expenses. And then, uh, figure out like a good solid tech stack that you're not going to be changing all the time. Do you, do you hold to a strict close deadline? It's, uh, not strict, but we're able to do it within five days right now. Yeah, we're we're we don't have a strict deadline. It's honestly about when can the owners meet and having it completed a couple of days before that. Um, but our goal was always um, always five days or less. Um, and so, but when I when I came in, they were doing it. Well, they were doing it slowly, but then they were also running financials every day of the month or multiple, you know, multiple times a month with incomplete data. And I said, multiple times per month. Yeah. Like they just be like, so, Hey, it's Wednesday, the 21st. Let's, exactly. uh, let's run a bit quick. They'd balance sheet we, here. Yeah. They, yeah, it's, it's, we're meeting today. So let's run a, let's run a P and L and then you end up having it. And that goes to people's misunderstanding of what the financial yeah. statement actually is. So yeah, I def- like half I, your sales are being done the last week. It's not even in that month yet. That exactly. Worked, that, yeah, I'm in a mental pretzel right now. I can't recover. I know. I had to say, wait, you're doing what? But anyways, they they uh, they did that. So we had to fix that. But then for me, the tools always just get in the way. And it's putting together checklists, however you want to deal with that checklist, whether it's a to-do list, whether it's a spreadsheet, whether it's documents, but then just work your way through that checklist. and. And just, I'm a big list person. I feel like I can wrap my arms around it if I just write it down, which sounds silly, but it's true. Yeah. Do you, so I've been going through a big thing with this. Like, how do you write out your procedures 
when it comes to like general and, and close, like how, how do you deal with those? So first step, hire a kick-ass controller so you don't have to write them out. <laughs> so that's what I do. And then uh, I'm more of, I'm a more big picture guy. Uh, basically, I'm working around when information has to exchange hands between stakeholders, as you mentioned, and then what needs to get updated based on that. So like, say you have a board deck, say you have like a pitch deck, you have different dashboards that go out to the company to say if you hit a goal or not. So I'm more like around when information exchanges hands and what the milestones are that you have to say you either hit or didn't hit. Um, I look at that checklist as like part of that other checklist, really. It's like two lines within my checklist of 10 other things that need to happen company-wide to socialize where we finished. Um, and then I also look around like what meetings need to happen with certain people to go over it. And then like, I take a lot of pride in like getting the FP and a part right around like socializing the budget packets to people. And all of those have deadlines of when it should go out to them. And then when we should meet with them. What about you? You, you, you have a much better accounting mind than me. I'm more from the FP and a world. When you just say, when you just say, Oh, I'm, I'm the big picture stuff. All I hear is I don't like to do any work. That's, that's my takeaway. Yeah. Um, I'm lazy. No, I, I, uh, well, every place, you know, every place I was CFO, I was the first one in that role, right? And so it was about one, hiring the right people, getting people in the right seats. Um, but then, you know, for a number of years, I was the controller and CFO, you know, because there was, we were building out that department. Yeah. So, so Player I coach. very... I'm very big on creating policy, creating high level policies that identify approvers and intent, and then creating checklists um, for each of those different processes that you have within those policies. Checklists would be done or documented in certain situations, but in other situations, the checklist was just to make sure you know, it was like, once you know the job, you're not doing the checklist. Um, but then every year going through and then trying to make sure that those, that documentation is updated. So, um, so like I had put together a, a policy manual and some procedural checklist, um, when I first came into the last job and then we hired a controller and I gave, they had to redo it cause we'd never finalized it. We'd done it we finalized a few things, but we'd left a lot undone because we were waiting for that controller. And I had him go build that piece out. I think it's important to be collaborative on those deals when you have the ability to, um, because you want to make sure it works for everyone and not just each for, accountant yeah. has their in controller has their own way of doing things too, that they're very particular yeah. about. Have you struggled with that in the past when you brought people in? Or are you like, Oh no, I, I like that you're bringing a different kind of view of, of how to get things done at close. No, I, I think, whoever owns that job has got to be responsible for how it gets done. And so that's where I go back to the policy of we're going to have specific, we're going to have specific things that need to be done and we're going to have specific deadlines and specific people that are approvers on different things. So we'll set, we'll set approval levels. We'll set these, but how you get to that final point is completely up to your, your way to work. That's good. Um, now, obviously there's collaboration and I tend to be right more than not, you know, so, <laughs> so, so, uh, you no, heard it here just, first, yeah. folks. I tend to be right more than not. So, you know, they come around to my way of thinking, Yeah, you know? but yeah. Stick no, the but carrot, right? yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah, but it's, it's just having open conversations for me. You put the back call out and just everybody answers you. Well, it's crazy how many people responded. I was going to say, um, I kind of induced some of that response. So, um, <laughs> I went and messaged some people. I was like, we need some questions. I don't want yeah. to. So, so um, I tried mom, to, mom, why didn't you put, why didn't you answer the question? I tried to help you out there. Let's finish up with one more question. All right. So how, what, what's your newsletter at now? Are you still good? I'm at, 30, uh, about to hit 35,000, 35,000. So, you, Walter, you, you're beating me, man. I am beating you now, actually. But I've been doing some paid acquisition. Again, going into the deal, uh, having fun with the newsletter. Yeah. So I'm concerned for Walter because you're growing so quickly. 
I'm concerned that the weight, you know, is, is he like, do we need to call in like animal control? Do we need to do anything? <laughs> like, I just want to make sure like, you know, you talking about my diabetic Bernadoodle. <laughs> Like you're just concerned for the health, you know, when, with ice cream coming so fast, like, do you have a plan for how much ice cream in the future? Or if you start scaling, are you just going to be every day is ice cream? He's willing to make this sacrifice. Okay. All right. We uh, honestly it got to the point where we were getting ice cream so often that we decided to get, uh, like the kitty, uh, vanilla hoodie ones from like walmart and we have them a bag in the in the freezer because the uh <laughs> the culvers like concrete mixers were a little too much he ruined a couple rugs so we had we had to uh <laughs> we had to get him smaller ice cream so the behind the I, I scenes wanna, look I want, you didn't know you needed <laughs> i want people to know though i want to assure you that he's still getting ice cream for every 1000 <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh so you you couldn't handle any more rugs so you went to the the lighter yeah lighter less calories okay you know. so we don't my concern was i was i was over the top with my concern but i just i just felt like we needed to look out for him so he's a good boy curtis where can people find you hey just just go find me on twitter go find me my newsletter frameworks and finance those are kind of the two places i like to hang so thanks for i'm an avid this reader was fun, man Avid subscription. We got to do this more often. Yeah, this was a good time. So, just I don't know guys. if you can afford me, you know, too much more often. But yeah, you know, we can talk. We the can checks negotiate. in the mail. If you could just wait <laughs> a week or two before you cash it. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see what the wife says. See if she's, you know, that was going, that was going to her. So, you know. All right, buddy. Thanks, man. Hey, man. Nice, nice to chat and. And, and been, I've been enjoying your interviews in the podcast, so keep at it. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. We're going to have to make you a staple on this show. Roll the credits, producer Nancy. The Run the Numbers podcast is part of the Turpentine Network of Podcasts. It is produced by Nancy Shu and edited by Justin Golden. Artwork made by some AI thing. Yelling an intro by Fat Joe. Don't forget to give us five stars. I really need this.